what, are, what do churches look like in a movement? Well, God loves his church. Jesus died for his bride. And so we love to celebrate what God is doing in existing churches. And we say to existing churches, don't waste time, energy, and blood in restructuring. Just start pursuing, get into the harvest, start making disciples. And then as you do that, people will become unfrozen because they're seeing the activity of God changing lives. They're seeing the gospel and discipleship happening. And there'll be some changes in your existing church. But typically what you need to do is, is not mess with that church. Um, let what God is doing shape it and change it somewhat. But your church might be a parent or a grandparent of the churches that are, are really going to multiply. So you want to honor and bless what you already have, but get into the harvest, start training your people, see who steps up and then fan that flame. But reassure everybody we're not enforcing this on you. But this is what the churches in a movement need to look like. You know, and my wife and I have done this. We planted a church so that we could preach the gospel and make disciples. And so all the energy went into the public service and the funding and I mean, I had to get paid. Uh, the sound system, the band, oh, small. I mean, we, we, we just put a lot of work into that and eventually we were able to get into the harvest. But first of all, we had to sort of build this thing. Well, there's another way. And that is start with the gospel. Go share the gospel with some people far from God and move from gospel into discipleship and then help new disciples form church. This is what Paul did. And um, the benefit of that is as the missionary, you're not going to settle down and pastor that church. Paul never stayed more than three years in any one place. And even there in Ephesus, he's reaching a whole region and a, and a whole city of 200,000. And church plantings happening up in Colossae and Laodicea. So it's gospel. It's disciples who are learning to follow and obey Jesus. And then as part of their discipleship, you're going to open uh, the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, 36 to 47. You're going to help those disciples early on discover, well, what is church? What, what, what do God's people do when they come together as community? What does it look like? What does it feel like? And you're going to get them to tell you. And we, we just do that. We just list those things. Well, I guess it looks like they love one another. Maybe a big heart sign. Or they celebrate Lord's Supper. You know, there's a symbol of a piece of bread. Uh, they believe and share the gospel. Uh, and, and they just go through different um, characteristics of this New Testament church. You can do that for yourself. You know, they, they sit under the teaching of the apostles, you know, which ultimately led to our, our New Testament. So they're word-centered. And they were baptized and they were baptizing others. So there are different characteristics of church. So we've got a, new, a group of new disciples who are on the journey of following Jesus and they're listing those things. And then we're going to say, well, what things do we do as a group of disciples? Oh, well, we, we're around the word together. We, we're learning to love one another. We're, oh, we're, gee, we're not giving generously and sacrificially. Hmm. That's something we need to do. Uh, well, do we have some leaders? There was leadership in the New Testament. Oh, well, no, but, well, I guess you're our leader because you've helped bring us together, but... Yeah, but I'll be moving on eventually. So, you know, what are the characteristics of New Testament leaders? Let's look at Timothy and Titus. You tell me, guys, what does a leader look like? Well, is there anyone in the room who's, who aspires to be like that? Well, yeah, Gary, but, you know, he, he's still got that raging temper of his and um, he's got some stuff to work through. Well, Gary, are you up to working on those issues? Because you might be a leader of this group if you do that. And so you're now helping. This is happening all around the world, you know, without sound systems, without lots of money, just 
new believers, but they're reading the Word of God together, not just for knowledge, but knowledge that leads to the obedience of faith, and present with them is the Holy Spirit. And that's how you form church. And so you might say, well, that's a long way from how we do church right now. That's okay. We'll just have some, some children, some grandchildren, and some great-grandchildren. And maybe some of the new believers will, will just I'll read that Acts 2 and they want to be part of your church. But, you know, we, we live in a world where, you know, I'm from Melbourne, a major city in, in, in Australia, and you can meet an English-speaking Iranian in Melbourne, an Iranian Australian. And by the evening of that day, through them, the gospel has gone to Tehran. And now you want to plant a church in Tehran through that new disciple. What are you going to do? Is, is your concept of church so uh, simple and yet powerful in a New Testament model that it can jump from Melbourne one day into Tehran the next. And it's happening. So that's what church looks like in a multiplying move.